issue of, uh, of truth and news. So closest to me, um, we start with uh, Matt T. Matt is the uh, CEO of Ipso um, and has been since 2014. That's the newspaper and magazine regulator in the UK. Matt is uh, uh, formerly uh, having worked in the NHS and the uh, civil service and, and he now leads the organisation responsible for holding um, journalists and news organisations to account uh, in this country. Um, part of Ipsos role, and it's, and it's studied by the students at our courses in their sort of ethics, in fact there are several exams on that, <coughs> is, to, uh, is to monitor and constantly update the editor's code, which uh, um, is the, the sort of code of practice uh, given a, a basis for how journalists behave, how they carry out their work. Um, it's also investigate and rule on complaints, they give advice and training to journalists and I think Matt's going to talk a little bit about, about the importance of the role of trust in a regulator uh, as well as just in journalists themselves. Uh, next to Matt we have Paul Rowland. Paul um, has uh, uh, been a journalist for uh, I think 13, 14 years now. Yeah. Paul is editor-in-chief of Media Wales, editor of Wales Online uh, and started uh, just over the road there as a, uh, a, a trainee with the uh, the Western Mail. You formed your mech as well, Paul? Yeah. 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 Great. Uh, again, proof positive of our success of turning out great journalists here. Um, Paul uh, is part of uh, the, the Media Wales, which is part of Reach, the UK's largest news publisher. He's also a newish father right? That's great. Um, of uh, uh, a few months. And he's going to talk about what trust means uh, in reality and, and uh, how it might get eroded in the publics and, and the minds of the audience. Um, we also have Emma Mees uh, next to Paul. Um, Emma runs the uh, Centre for Community Journalism, which is based here at Cardiff. Uh, set up in 2013, they give training, advocacy and support to hyperlocal and community journalists. She's a, 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 a champion of, uh, of hyperlocal news. Um, and works with partners from government to Google, really, in, uh, in looking at innovation and training and, uh, and seeks to uh, uh, highlight the importance of that particular sector of journalism. Um, they've got partners the sort of length and breadth of Britain who work, work there, and Emma's going to talk a bit about trust in uh, hyperlocal media as well. And then finally, on the end there, we have uh, Bethan Syed. Bethan is the like Cymru AM for South West Wales, um, and none of this Namby Pamby Westminster single portfolio business. Bethany is shadow housing, poverty, and community spokesperson. She's the steel spokesperson, and she chairs the Assembly's Culture, Welsh Language, and Communications Committee. So um, she's only got to work us out there. Part of that that work has been a report on the future of news journalism in Wales. Um, and we, they, they talked about the idea of Welsh government support for some uh, local news organisations in Wales. Um, her brother is also formerly a Cardiff journalist, Kieran, uh, who works at Channel 4. Still remember what I was going to say now, so oh, I don't sorry. Really yeah, Kieran, he works at Channel 4. Kieran, yeah, he's a yeah. Channel 4 news reporter and was a, a, a former student on one of our <laughs> courses as well, just to keep that theme going. Um, so uh, we, we'll also be really uh, um, looking forward to hearing what Bethan has to say. So talking with, I'll say no more on that now, and I'll first of all introduce uh, Matt T. Everybody, thank you. Um, thank you very much indeed, and thanks very much to the College School for Journalism to for uh, joint hosting this event and for allowing us to use their wonderful new building. Uh, the smell of new paper is dandy. Um, if you have anything to do with the world of journalism, then the Cardiff School is uh, a well-known name. Uh, you only have to walk around the outside of this building and see some of the graduates of uh, this place to understand the sort of quality of uh, training that goes on here. See your picture outside. And thank you also to the rest of the panel for uh, coming here tonight. Um, when we first started Ipso four years ago, we used to do road shows on our own. And literally nobody turned up because really why would you turn up to talk about press regulation unless you were really 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 interested or you got paid for it like me um, so we sort of spread it a bit and made it about something that was bigger than, than just uh, press regulation and, and that's how we come to be uh, doing this tonight um, I have indeed been chief executive so for the four years that the organization has been going 
and it's sort of quite difficult to remember um, what sort of atmosphere um, Ipso was born into. Um, I did uh, a speaking event actually at the Goldsworth for Journalism in about four years ago, it was certainly in the first year of it. So. And uh, there were two people there from Hacked Off, and they were interrupting when I was speaking and diving in. And, and some of that still happens, but it's an awful lot calmer. Um, over the four years, we've taken 50,000 complaints and inquiries from members of the public. Uh, we have uh, issued multiple pieces of guidance for editors and for the public on uh, subjects as wide as um, coverage of uh, transgender um, issues, uh, suicide and deaths, and, and those sort of things. The issues where editors have said to us, uh, or journalists have said to us, it would be really helpful if you could give us some guidance on how you apply the editor's code in, in this circumstance. And the editor's code is, is the, the code we apply. Um, tonight, um, I'm going to canter through sort of how the world's changed um, and why that means we need to think about uh, media and content we can trust in a, in a sort of slightly different way. And in writing this, I began to realise that I was quite old. And then looking around the audience tonight, I realised I'm really old. Um, but when I started working, um, there were three television stations. Uh, there were six radio stations. There were seven national newspapers. That's almost the same. Uh, and everywhere had a local newspaper, and quite a lot of places had two local newspapers. Certainly in London at the time, there were two competing local evening newspapers, both paid for, both profitable. Um, and there was no internet, there was no social media, and there was no email. And while I know this is going to sound a long time ago to you, because it's all before a lot of you were born, that's only 30 years ago. Right? So 30 years ago, if you look at the changes in almost any other industry or sector, uh, in 30 years. If you look at the changes in car technology, even though car technology in the last 10 years has significantly changed, changes in car technology in the last 30 years, negligible compared to the changes in the information sector, if you want to talk about it as, as broadly as that. Um, when I first started working, you pretty much got your media, you got your news, you got your information from a very small number of sources and they were produced by people who were there because they were professional journalists and wanted to get things right. And there were mistakes made, and there were still mistakes made, but by and large, when you picked up a newspaper or you turned on the radio or the television, you could trust what you saw on the television. You could trust that had been produced in a professional manner and, and you, that, that was uh, uh, likely to be a reasonably faithful telling of, of the actuality. And now, of course, things have changed. And I'm just going to give three examples of, of where um, things have changed and that it's no longer anywhere near as simple as that. And my three examples are not intended to be comprehensive or they're not intended to be a definition of fake news, but just things that have happened uh, in my bit of life and social media in, in the last week or so. Um, so um, last night on Facebook, uh, a friend of mine, um, He's, he's not cavalier, he doesn't post wild claims about the dark side of the news, um, posted or, or reposted a story on uh, Facebook about how it's dangerous to drink out of fizzy drink cans or beer cans um, without washing the top of the can because there's a danger that rodents, particularly rats, will have urinated over the top and you can get something called vials disease in that kid. Right. Now, this had been widely shared. I did a check on it on, on Facebook. It's just not true. Right? Um, if you look at the evidence for it, there is absolutely no reliable evidence that you can find anywhere that anybody has died from drinking out of a drinks can without washing the top of it. Yeah? And this is a rational man who has retweeted this interesting piece of information, which would be even more jolly interesting if it was true. Right? And, and that's the reality of the world we live in. You know, I happen to be very interested in this stuff, so when I see a story like that, I go, is that true? And I do something about it, but not everybody does. Um, second example for me is uh, last week, President Trump again claimed that America was building the wall with Mexico. Do you know how much of the wall with Mexico is built? None. 
Absolutely none at all. Congress have refused to fund it. Mexicans refuse to fund it. There is no building of a wall in Mexico going on at all. And yet the President of the United States claims that that is the real thing. Yeah? And for me, you know, I, I'm, I am singling out President of the United States because he makes it so easy. But it is true, with very honourable exceptions, that there are some politicians who will now get away with telling things which are basic falsehoods. And in an age you know, gone by, generally, we expected our politicians to tell the truth and to be caught out if they didn't. And there are some spectacular stories from the 70s and 80s of, of politicians getting caught out. We now have politicians who mix truths and falsehoods on a constant basis and get away with it and are not called out, but partly because there's so much of it. <coughs> if you call them out on every single falsehood they tell, you'd be there forever. Um, you know, it's just not, it's not possible to do. So you know, we add to the multiplicity of things that are, um, you know, make it difficult to know where, where you get trusted news from. Um, and then the third thing that sort of happened in um, you know, my, my Facebook world um, is a really, really small one. Yeah? But it concerns my local non-league football club. And somebody posted on Twitter yeah, that it was three days from going out of business. Right? Now, I happen to know the chairman of the club and I could ring him up and say, is this true? <coughs> but actually, by the time I'd done that, that had been shared 150 times on Twitter. Yeah? And that is how unverified information, which in my opinion, mean, there's no reason why it should be news to you. But in my community, amongst the people who go and watch that team, that's news, right? And, and that isn't true. So we're in a position where um, we've had this explosion in channels, which are often not regulated or moderated. You know, nobody looks at what you post on Twitter or Facebook before it gets posted. Um, that just doesn't happen. It's just too much scale to possibly do that. And that presents us with a significant issue in terms of where do you get news that, that you might trust? Um, and part of where we get to in that is also that we've had an increase in populism, particularly amongst politicians. Um, Trump is an example, but there are examples on the left as well. And what they also lead us to is an echo chamber of people who believe the same things who will reinforce their own untruths. Yeah? So there is a belief amongst some supporters of Jeremy Corbyn that opinion polls are just made up pieces of rubbish, you know, particularly ones that they don't like the results of. Uh, now, actually, I can tell you that there is a great deal of science behind opinion polls, and you can, you can analyse them, but to say that they're all rubbish is just not true. But, but the echo chamber means that people reinforce those voices, and unlike what used to happen at some point, um, those people don't listen to challenging voices, and so what that becomes perceived truth, and that's an issue for us as well. Um, so this is where we get to, to a very reasonable challenge to me, which is, so you're talking about the sort of fake news phenomenon and what's the cure? And the answer is I don't know. Right? All of that is genie that's out of the bottle and is too big for us to be able to, to stuff back in the bottle. There are huge benefits for social media. I'm sure you know, people in this room have um, any number of media accounts. I was doing some work with some people from the <coughs> United Arab Emirates on Monday this week, uh, where penetration of Twitter and Facebook is close to 90% amongst the adult population. You know, this thing isn't going back in the bottle. This thing is real. And actually, uh, I've looked at how do you regulate that. And that becomes very difficult, partly because it's global, partly because... Uh, the sheer volume of it all becomes very difficult. And so part of it seems to me is we need to be in a place where we're talking to people about what are the characteristics of media that you should be able to trust. Yeah? And, and trust, I think, is an important word around this. And for me, you know, if you ask me what, me, what news do I trust, um, I trust news which is produced by people who have been trained to be journalists, um, mostly paid, but people who've been trained, trained to be journalists. Um, it's generally edited before it's published. Yeah? More than one pair of eyes have looked at that piece of news before it actually gets published into the world and asked some questions about it. 
that doesn't happen quite as much as it used to and as much as I'd like it to, but it's still, I think, a desirable thing. Um, it's produced to a code of practice. Um, and I don't say it has to be our code of practice, but I do think having a code of practice that covers the things that matter to people, that covers accuracy, that covers privacy, some of those things, is very important. And my final category is that those people are open to challenge. You, there is a way of complaining about the thing that they have published. And that, for me, begins to say, if it meets those characteristics, this is, this is a thing of a uh, piece of content that you might begin to trust, or at least to start from a point where you say, this might well be true and right. Maybe I you know, will challenge it further on, but let's start from a position that this is produced by a company and for me, that's why having a regulator is important. Um, there's, no, there's no absolute reason why you have to have a regulator of newspapers and magazine type of content, but having a regulator gives a way of the public, of consumers, being able to say, has this publication, has this publisher signed up to <coughs> that code of standards? Do we expect them to produce content in a professional way? Are they open to challenge? You know, for any of the publications that signed up to it, so you can complain to me about any article that, that they publish, um, and I will look into that. So those things are important. It's not essential that you're part of the regulator. The Financial Times isn't a part of IPSO. Uh, I generally trust the Financial Times conduct, uh, uh, content, but the Financial Times meets all of the criteria that I've talked about. And because all of that matters, I think it is both important that people begin to know more that there is a regulator of newspapers. We all have something this year uh, called the Ipso Mark, which we encourage publishers to carry in their publications so that when people look at a local newspaper, for example, they can see that it's um, uh, regulated by Ipso. Um, but also, it's important that people can trust the regulator. So we are, uh, transparency is one of our values. Uh, we publish an annual report. Uh, every adjudication that we make is published on our website. Every resolution we meet uh, with between a publisher and a complainant is also published on our website. So the transparency is there for people to look at how we are doing our job and to say whether or not we're doing a good thing. All of that is not the answer to fake news, but it's part of the answer to giving people a basis for knowing whether they can trust content. And I think that's the beginning of the answer to fake news. So I'm going to talk about fake news, and I'm going to talk um, a little bit about what fake news is, but I'm going to talk more about how fake news is used as a term, and how damaging that can be. Because no one will argue with me if I say that fake news has had a, a frightening and, and benign impact on our society, on our journalism, our democracy, you might have already um, touched on quite a lot of examples uh, of that. You know, what we're talking about is cynical and deliberate misinformation that's disseminated unchecked on social media. It poisons discourse, it skews public opinion uh, beyond reality and undermines um, democracy. Fake news is a growing tumour in, in how we uh, understand the forces that influence our lives. Uh, and as Matt says, the solution to that is complicated and it's not immediately clear um, what we can do about it in, in a single stroke. Um, what uh, troubles me uh, increasingly just as much, though, is the, is the willingness with which some, say, you know, honourable exceptions, but some mainstream politicians, public figures, and other people who interact with the world, with the media, uh, have displayed in co-opting the language of fake news um, uh, for their own ends, to suit their own purposes. So let me just explain what I mean by that. Um, fake news is a very specific thing. Um, I've already defined it. It's producing and distributing material that deliberately misleads the intention of promoting a given agenda. So that's a very specific thing. Um, it's not a lot of things. It's not an educated analysis of a situation that just differs from the way you see the world. Um, it's not um, allegations made against you that you prefer weren't true or in the public domain. Um, it's not inconvenient facts. Um, someone who chooses to pursue a different line in an interview with you uh, uh, isn't someone who's committing that to fake news. Even a story which is comprehensively researched, but later, uh, and published in good faith, but later goes on to uh, emerge that maybe some details are inaccurate, that isn't fake news. Um, but 
all of those are examples of situations where journalists have been accused <coughs> of perpetuating fake news by politicians, public figures, across the political spectrum, from you know Donald Trump to <coughs> Jeremy Corbyn and pretty much every member of the UK um, current cabinet in between uh, at some point. Um, fake news has become another word like clickbait uh, in the way we talk about um, our journalism and our publishers. Um, it's a term to describe something malevolent and very specific, but instead, rather than being used accurately, it's become a, a catch-all phrase for something that we see on the internet that we don't really like to look at or doesn't fit our, our worldview. Does any of that matter? Um, am I being oversensitive as a publisher? Um, am I being a snowflake? Um, I don't think so. Um, we exist in a time when established publishers like ours and many uh, others um, uh, growing threat from uh, dramatic and, and constant change in media consumption habits. It's basically a, a perfect storm, you know, for established practitioners like us, where professional qualifications, as Matt says, are still mandatory, uh, where verification still means something, and standards and processes are absolutely endemic to what we do. Um, but as I say, the business model is under threat. There are changes in the way that we consume our media. Uh, Google and Facebook are just uh, among them. Uh, and. Um, the way that we consume our information and disseminate the way that echo changes, the way we can curate our own uh, uh, content that we like to consume on, on social media, uh, achieve the moment. And then alongside that, we have well-meaning politicians uh, warning about the loss of crucial scrutiny, which is absolutely important uh, uh, to everyone and, and matters to us as much as anything else, that the decline of the press will bring about. But on the same hand, we've got others um, urging their followers, as Jeremy Corbyn did last month, to bypass the mainstream media, um, seek their news from more suitable sources on social media, not trusted sources, I'd say, uh, and people who actively seek to undermine the credential of journalists report fairly and competently in the public interest. And that perfect storm to me of a uh, threat to the media by um, people talking about fake news, but also uh, that twin impact of uh, a undermining erosion of trust in um, journalists' ability to do their job um, is really damaging. I mean, every polemic I read on the importance of protecting our local publishers is kind of weaved in uh, with barbs about timely standards, low skills, lost experience, uh, and just collective turning of backs on our role as a, as a watchdog of democracy. Now, I won't seek to argue that um, we have, and many publishers like us have fewer journalists than we had in the past. Um, you know, the well-documented revenue uh, declines seen in the written press allow for nothing else. Um, but those that exist uh, remain every bit as skilled, committed, and engaged as they ha ever have been, I'm sure. My colleagues here will be a testament to the, the, the wide variety of skills that um, students emerging in the industry from schools like this one have. So in an atmosphere where large parts of the public need no second invitations, distrust and bypass professional journalists, there are many people who deliberately or accidentally um, uh, give them all the encouragement they need to do exactly that. Um, so whose news can you trust? Um, to my mind, it's the news of experienced, professional, impartial, qualified journalists. Uh, and we've really got to stop undermining that news just because it might be politically expedient to do so. scale news publishers, so community and hyper-local news publishers, that's the sector that I work in. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how uh, the sector's kind of come about to be more established and why it's so important that we support this sector when it comes to looking at um, fake news. So since uh, 2005, uh, more than 200 local newspapers have closed in the UK and the number of uh, regional journalists have halved from 13,000 up to about 6,500. Um, staff cuts, centralised newsrooms, uh, set Edison and printers relocated miles away from local communities, uh, leaving press benches in councils and courtrooms increasingly empty. Um, and this is an issue that we've seen increasingly, not just across the UK, but we've seen across the world as well. So an estimated 15% of the country now has no daily or regional title and rural areas are increasingly reliant 
on London-based media and their own social networks for local news. And that, as uh, Paul was saying, once people start relying on, on social media for the news, that's where we hit the really slippery slope. Because, uh, you know, where the journalists, and the job of a, the role of a journalist is to fact-check, to verify, to seek the truth, um, and to get bits of information, almost like putting a jigsaw together, where you get pieces of information, and then you question, and you examine, and you interrogate, and then you check again, and then you piece it together, and then you present it as a piece of factual information. And that's the role of a journalist. So once you start getting news and information via social media, um, my mum, bless her, gets a real hard time when I talk about these kinds of things. Is that you just want to look at the kind of things my mum hates share on. You know, and then I'm ringing her up, going, do you really need to share that now? Uh, and it's not just her, it's, you know, there's so many people and so many things come into my timeline. And I can go, oh, you know. But we're not taught, you know, education's part of this, we're not taught as human writer to kind of really examine and question. Just because somebody tells you something doesn't mean it's true. Uh, a study in 2016 found that towns whose local uh, daily local newsrooms had shut suffered from a, a democracy deficit, which the term in the report, with reduced community engagement and increased distrust of public bodies. So Dr. Martin Law, uh, who published the report, said we can all have our own social media account, but when local papers are depleted, or in some cases simply don't exist, people lose a communal voice. And that communal voice is really important for, uh, for strong, healthy communities. That was me saying last night. Um, uh, and back to Martin, saying they feel angry, not listened to, and more likely to believe malicious rumour. Um, and it's because it's not necessarily the, the, the big investigations, not the sexy stuff, it's the bread and butter, day to day things that people didn't really notice when they were kind of just getting uh, decreasing amounts of this news and information. People didn't notice because it was happening fairly gradually. Um, but this is where the community and hyper local news sector have emerged and stepped in to plug the gap. So where large media organisations have either withdrawn or retreated completely from communities across the UK, we were finding that there were these really small grassroots publications, sometimes just one person, saying, do you know what, I, I haven't got anywhere to go and get local news information. So they say, do you know what, I'm going to set up my own. And because of uh, the internet, gone are the days where you, know, you needed to be a big organisation, a really big, slow-moving beast in order to publish news, now you can just set up a WordPress site really cheaply, really quickly, and you can be publishing news. Um, so from the issue to support this new emerging sector, that's where the Centre for Community Journalism was born, that's where, that's where we kind of established back in 2013. So Professor Jessica Lewis, who was head of school at the time, was fed up of going to conferences all over the world where people were weighing in about the death of journalism and said, actually, why don't we put our money where our mouths are and actually put something and see if we can support these new grassroots uh, news publications <coughs> emerging. So uh, over the first five years, we set up and worked really closely with 10, either set them up from scratch or worked with ones that existed already, 10 uh, community and hyper-local news publications across Wales. And what that did was it gave us, before uh, we kind of went any further in the sector, it gave me in particular a really... A uh, good view of what people are going through in order to publish news and information. So I sat there on a Wednesday night in a freezing cold church hall. You know, the heating doesn't come on for Sundays. Um, you know, and it's raining outside. And, you know, been there, done that, got the hat and the t shirt. And actually, did they all succeed? No, they didn't. But we learned from our failures as much as our successes. So finding out why something didn't work is as valuable as why something is working. Um, and it gave us enough information and knowledge of the sector and being in the sector for five years we realized actually what the sector didn't have was one voice and it's a very very diverse sector um and and what we uh, realize that when you're kind of a sole trader or a micro business which is what um, a lot of these are is that you do tend to work in silo so um you know any additional support can be invaluable to helping you thrive and grow so so that's what we've done what uh, is setting up a newspaper is not difficult, as I said, or a news publication. What's difficult is running it on a day-to-day -day basis, is making sure that you get good, accurate stories, that you get new information, that you build up your contacts, you know your community, and that you are working as a business person at the same time. Uh, you know, working, uh, running the day-to-day -day gauntlet of breaking news and also uh, simultaneously bringing in enough money to keep going. That's, that's hard going, and that's what a number of news publishers are facing. Um, these days. Uh, what's hard effectively is existing in the current media ecology that we have. 
So training takes time and commitment. Skills need to be built through experience and practice. Um, but all this hard work put in by dedicated hyperlocal journalists is paying off as we see great civic value being developed through community journalism. So creating a network of community news hubs to share learning is especially important in this emerging sector where many practitioners work in isolation, as I've said. Um, as well as working with the sector, we've also been working in partnership with the National Assembly for Wales. Um, and I think we're really fortunate here in Wales that as an assembly, they are doing a lot of work to see how they can better engage with the citizens, the people of Wales, because they understand the value of people knowing the decisions that are being made by politicians on our behalf. And they are increasingly concerned that with um, fewer news publications and fewer journalists, how do you get that message out? How do people realise that what happens in the Senate, in the National Assembly, is of utmost importance to, uh, to you, whether you are in rural West Wales or whether you are in one of our cities? Um, we're also fortunate, as I'm sure you'll hear from, from Betha, and that she and her colleagues fought to secure £200,000 for news publishers in our sector and Wales. So we're currently undertaking research into how that money should be spent to have the most impact. So, so what we do is we provide a voice for this sector um, at a grassroots level where journalism is most valued and most trusted um, and actually where it's most at risk for all the reasons that I've already mentioned. Um, and that's why in January this year we launched the Independent Community News Network which is also known as ICNN. Uh, it's a representative body for independent community and hyperlocal news publishers right across the UK and we're committed to supporting and representing the publishers both in digital and in print and our focus as I said is at this grassroots level but no matter what Mark was saying just now um, about um, what is a quality and reputable publisher so we worked a lot with various organisations including the BBC to come up and define what a quality and reputable news publisher is because that's what we wanted the members of ICNN to be. Um, now there's around 400 plus um, local <coughs> locals that we know of, but new ones emerge daily. Some go by the wayside and new ones emerge. And um, we are really fortunate as of this week to have 100 of those signed up as members. So when you become a member of ICNN, uh, you adhere, you say that you will either be um, regulated or adhere to the editor's code of practice. Um, you have to um, show a history of contemporaneous reporting. It has to be editorial input. You can't just be single issue. Um, and also you have to have a robust complaints procedure, so um, that's either linked to on our website or put on every publisher's website within the paper so that anybody's got any issues, they know how to follow through and, co and, and complain or reach out to the person that's written that story. And that's really important and also they now have access to um, legal support. So Google Bank is one of the leading legal law experts in the UK and we have him on a retainer. So when I worked for the BBC for nearly 14 years, I could pick up the phone to the legal team who had this order of policy any hour of the day or night, 24 hours would be there. So now that's a service that actually we have our members that um, nobody's done day with two in the morning yet. Um, I'm sure it's going to happen. Um, but actually it means that they can be braver and actually stronger in their reporting. It's not about what they can't say, but as much about what they can say as well. So um, so this is, is really, really important um, for us, that there is this support and understanding of this new emerging sector, because at grassroots level, that's where it's most trusted and it's more trusted for reasons because you're so much closer to the source because uh, you know th these reporters these hyper local and community news publishers they live in the communities they live in a patch like an old school patch report i used to do years ago so the chances are of this kind of chinese whispers of not knowing the source of the story hardly ever happens because they know the people they've spoken to the people and that's where they've got the information from so um you know, that's, that's why it's a lot more um, trusted, because you, you're more likely to know the reporter on a personal level. And that's why I believe so passionately in supporting the community in the hyper-local news sector as it grows both in size and in strength. That's why it's really important that we invest in this sector. Interesting um, to come here and talk about uh, some of the questions from the perspective of a politician, um, not a journalist and academic, because I know that uh, we have conflicting views, and I think that's healthy um, as we're here to talk about journalism and how healthy it is to have those uh, different opinions. Um, journalists and politicians have had a long relationship, reaching back as far as the first mass 
circulation pamphlets and papers. Journalism and the development of an independent media were key milestones in the development of modern democracy in the UK and elsewhere, whether it was pamphlets lampooning uh, the king's new mistress or scandalising the lives of the aristocracy, because only that happened more now, an independent media has been crucial in keeping the presence of a strong uh, media. The French Revolution may have never exploded into the enormous world of the events of the claim had it not been for the constant media and chattering class attention on the lavish lifestyles of those at Versailles. Of course, things changed. For many years, we became used to the image of the press officer, spinning lines to a Quaker press in the gallery, or a special advisor discussing the veracity of the story, or a journalist and newspaper team heroically going after a huge story, spending weeks, months researching the effect that that would have on their community. As I said, uh, you said earlier, had her brother who had done those investigative uh, pieces of work. I think I understand to an extent uh, those uh, views. And Paul mentioned uh, fake news. I would urge you, if you do uh, watch Channel 4 News, my brother actually went to the Balkans and did a, uh, a, a special piece on um, some of the sources of fake news coming from young men uh, in North, those Balkan states making money from fake news about American uh, stories, about American politics. And I think that was a really strong uh, story uh, for, for us all to, to, to know about and to, to watch. We're all used to the state of play uh, type preconceptions about uh, the relationships between uh, politicians um, and the media. Of course, the link uh, and engagement uh, between politics and journalism in the modern world uh, is changing rapidly and has already changed uh, beyond recognition. Today, if I wanted to put a story out of myself or my side company colleagues have been working on, um, often by traditional methods, uh, but not always, there is still uh, the option for a, a journalist. Uh, we almost always do, even if we want to put something out uh, on social uh, media. Um, like a lot of other things, uh, the reality is a lot less glamorous or underhanded uh, than many believe it to be. It's often just about building basic relationships of trust and understanding the common interests uh, for both players. So a journalist, we know who have special interests in certain topics, and we talk to them directly about those interests. Maybe we go to somebody else with another uh, type of story, and I think that's a really important function to retain uh, for the future. Uh, despite uh, the growth of social media, I know, and you all will know, that quite often there is no substitute for the strength analysis and reach of an established news organisation. But this is where the biggest change can be seen in the Welsh media landscape, as Emma has already said. Wales has never uh, had a particularly pluralistic, independent uh, Welsh media on a national level, I'm afraid to say. Uh, and the decline and consolidation of what industry there is has presented uh, problems. <laughs> While I respect that organisations do their best and the decline in print sales and the revenue coming with it has been exceedingly difficult, the fact that we still only have one national title with sales lower than many local titles is problematic. So I know um, we will hear that people are considering online more and more, more so. Uh, you wouldn't expect uh, nor wish to see such a situation in any other democratic uh, nation, but in Wales this has been the case for far too long. Um, what used to balance this out was a persona of strong, independent, local titles, uh, but many of these tools have disappeared from our streets. Um, you know, I, uh, I live in England, that's where we can, um, we could have accessed the news Guardian many years ago, and having that open door policy um, has been uh, really effective over the, the years. But also, uh, even when uh, the, the news Guardian office closed, we did see some really um, good journalists from the South Wales Evening Post just doing what politicians do actually, and having an advice to surgery in a local cafe, collecting ideas uh, in a different way, um, not expecting that an office was entirely necessary for the work uh, that, that he uh, could do. Uh, the independence and individual spirit and ethos of independent titles has dissipated and we have to recognise that uh, and that makes, um, as Emma said, people feel uh, less engaged on a local level, they feel disempowered and I think that has a lot to do with uh, the Brexit vote um, and how people feel there's a vacuum of news locally and uh, how they feel that sometimes there's nowhere to go to if they do have a piece of news uh, that they would like uh, to take forward. Um, so what I think is really important is how we create a financially successful and pluralistic media environment uh, in Wales. 
I think we have to look at boosting our efforts in a more diverse uh, and unsuccessful uh, hyper-local sector. Uh, we've heard uh, that uh, many startups have been really successful, but others may have not been. Um, I supported and endorsed uh, the Paul Magnus uh, in my area. Um, many stories that were cover, covered there were not covered in the South Wales Open Report. They took that risk, uh, but of course that wasn't able to be sustainable uh, in the long term, which is why um, I think it was important for the committee that I chair in the National Assembly for Wales to look at how uh, we can uh, provide um, funding for those organisations that want to be sustainable for the future. So as part of the Plaid Cymru um, budget deal uh, with the Labour Party in Wales, I put forward uh, the idea of having um, a fund uh, put in this. And of course now we know there's research uh, being uh, carried out uh, uh, via some parties in this room to look at how that money can be spent. Our committee suggested it should be a contestable fund. We didn't want to prescribe to hyper-local hyper how they should run uh, their journalistic endeavours. We didn't think that was appropriate because some people might have uh, enough funding uh, or advertising revenue, but they might not have enough skills in other places. Uh, so that's what where we were coming from. But of, of course, when we do the announcement from the Welsh Government, uh, we'll be uh, pleased to know uh, that the money will be going to somewhere that are uh, individual with experts uh, helping to decide where that, that money uh, goes. Um, I think what's important uh, for, for me to, to, to just say briefly as well, um, and I think it's no um, surprise that I would say this, is that what we see quite a lot in um, the news uh, provision, especially at the UK level, is a lack of understanding as to the devolved aspects of uh, governance here in Wales. You know, I see it every day almost, um, uh, be it in The Guardian, be it on BBC Breakfast, uh, be it in, in, in many other news outlets. Um, I don't want to just pinpoint those ones, but there, there are other, other um, news outlets that are culpable. And that makes people then um, uh, fail to understand what the, um, the context of their politics is. You know, for example, there was an article yesterday that uh, Jeremy Corbyn had uh, um, wrote about maternity services at crisis point in England and Wales, with no recognition of the fact that the Labour government actually run maternity services in Wales. Um, so, so lumping it with what the English government is doing is actually quite um, mistaken, if not negligible. So I think where we have politicians uh, saying these things, they have to be held to account. And I'm sad to say as well, um, Perhaps it happened a bit in Wales when Theresa May came here, she made a few announcements, she made an announcement on social care in Wrexham that had no relevance to the people of Wrexham, but that wasn't really reported either in the, in the local press. And I think where we have good journalists, we should expect um, those journalists to uh, remember at all occasions where those policies lie and who makes uh, those uh, decisions. Um, what I'd like to finish on, um, I mean, I would say as a Plaid Cymru politician that trust, um, and I think it reflects what Emma was saying earlier, if we can bring uh, newspapers and politics closer to the people, mm -hmm. the trust becomes something more genuine. And I think so too then, uh, regarding the powers over devolution of broadcasting, if we could have the powers here in Wales uh, to make decisions over our broadcasting and our, our newspaper structures uh, and hold people to account, uh, then I think we would be better for it moment we're not being served effectively by many uh, in the UK press uh, and I think that's something that we should all be thinking about and something our committee has said um, is a bit red in the face about how we can be better represented so we've called for news opt-out from Radio 2 for Wales, uh, we've called for more investment um, in Welsh news programming uh, so that we can better reflect the Wales uh, that uh, we live in. I would like to finish and say I know that I've made some negative comments about um, how you know journalism operates, but I think that would be to be expected from somebody coming from uh, the outside and somebody who uh, is in the role that I'm in um, as chair of the committee, where we have to scrutinise what's happening here in Wales. But I would like to finish saying you know we do appreciate and we do um, want to thank everybody who works in the industry because it is something that we should value to the core because if we don't have um, strong uh, media outlets to scrutinise us then we are the poorer for it and I think you know there may be times and there has been times uh, where I've um, not um, <laughs> really enjoyed the scrutiny um, of, uh, of the press but you know at the end of the day um, we are in public office and that's something that we have to be um, 
totally aware of in any decision that we make and um, I think that's something that you know if we go down the line of the Trump like agenda at questioning uh, some of the news the genuine news providers in his own nation then we are going down a very very slippery slope indeed uh, and that's a very scary place to be and I, I didn't really want to mention Trump but I think it's uh, something that we should all be concerned about because I think that's something that's uh, coming through on social media in this country uh, through social media networks and it's something that we have to try uh, and uh, fight against. Okay, I, uh, so at the beginning we're going to have time for questions at the end. Uh, we have got a roving mic, if uh, also I can switch it on with the technology. Um, I've got some questions to kick us off if, if you want, but I'm not sure I'll give you the opportunity if you want to ask one first. Thank you. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Abu Bakr, I'm, from, I'm an environmental journalist from Pakistan. The issue that uh, what we are facing is that with regards to environment, there are not many environmental journalists who are practicing it. So what leads is that uh, whatever happens is being reported and not being investigated. Last year, the smog issue prevailed and based on NASA's imagery, which showed uh, paddy fields being burned in both India and Pakistan, the government of Pakistan spent more than $20,000 just to say that just due to stubble burning on the Indian side, there is smog on Pakistan side and trying to absolve themselves of the responsibility to protect their people from smog. So the thing was the entire media followed the bandwagon and you know, criticize the Indian government that you know it's because of them that we are having smog. So I did try to write an investigative piece. A few colleagues of mine did that. But of course, two, three, four pieces won't help. When a narrative is being built, how can we fight such fake news? That's the question. Um, I, I, I think, um, to my mind, I, mean, I can't profess to have any knowledge of um, that specific issue you're talking about, but um, uh, I think you know, if you look at climate change, Particularly, um, and outside sort of partisan politics, it's one of those issues where echo chambers exist. I think in one of the most damaging ways possible. Um, you know, you look at the IPCC report um, uh, from last week. I think it's apocalyptic, and yet there are echo chambers that still exist and are allowed to exist and encouraged to exist, <coughs> fostered by by interest groups um, that uh, that would deny that it's that it exists. Say it's a hoax. Um, and you know, I, I think as a case study of you know <coughs> what can be done to um, to challenge that climate change is very uh, uh, it's a very interesting one because um, the problem is not necessarily the absence of facts or um, interrogation or investigation mm -hmm. about it. It's the active decision of parties who've already made the decision on that front that it's a hoax, which is not true for whatever reason. It's the active decision to ignore those um, those investigations, those truths, those facts, um, and that is a really troubling thing because the way that the media um, has always been is that if something is out there that doesn't feel like the truth, and the media exposes that it's not the truth, then that rebalances the um, the, 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 the the situation on that and and and, and the stores, as it were, the, the, the situation we need to kill. If we are ignoring those facts, if we are building as we can now, um, as anyone can, a, a news ecosystem, excuse the sort of unfortunate pun, uh, around them um, that, that, that just is built around things which just confirm their initial um, uh, uh, suspicions, feelings, biases, whatever you want to call it. It means that you know, if your piece, if you've written your piece and you, you need two, three, four, you can get published, so you take two, three, four pieces. 400 pieces might not change it if you choose to black them out your world. And um, I think that's um, that's a really um, troubling thing that it is beyond just media companies to um, to sort out because, you know, it's a belief of mine that, 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 that goes beyond this, that you, know, you can write all the stories you like about something, people choose not to read them because they don't fit their worldview or they don't think they matter to them, then that's a bigger problem than just writing more stories about it. Um, there's also in the UK, so there's some fantastic work being done by the Bureau Local 
Uh, and what they do is they get people from all industries right across the uh, UK coming together and investigating particular topics. So that's something that works really well, teams of volunteers. And uh, Paul and I uh, were speaking with Megan Lucero yesterday, uh, who runs the Bureau Local, and they initially thought that journalists would come together, and they ended up getting politicians, techies, uh, people from all walks of life, uh, people that work in financial departments, all coming together and then they choose to do a particular topic and then they have set days where volunteers just come together and say, okay, well, I'm a numbers guy, I will look at the, this sort of these figures and they look at big data sets and they try and extract from that. So in the same way as, um, you know, the, with the Panama Papers, lots of individual journalists from lots of different publications came together and that's one way of doing it is that you can get lots of very local stories and when you bring them together they're of national importance so you get a big national story with lots of local angles and then if that gets published on lots of um, different platforms so there was there was an issue with um, with rail up in the um, up in the north in England and a number <coughs> of rival what we would probably class as rival publications as well as hyper local um, television print and uh, radio all came together <laughs> and all published the same copy at the same day and that in itself carries a lot of power and a lot of strength and show that you know this is and that's the bread and butter of local journalism has been campaigns and that's something that's of utmost importance some uh, some hyper locals have, have founded just based on they set up purely to campaign for something amazing <coughs> um, and that's something really important so if it's something that's, that's kind of really important and you think oh we're only three or four then it might be worth just looking and saying if you've got lots of local publications we'll all come together and maybe we'll all work on a set of questions based on that area when you bring them together then you'll have a really good national story that might be a way of looking at it. strikes me that uh, we kind of all know each other, um, but we all work in our silos. But we may be a zone where, whether it's a, a, a Wales trust mark or whether it's supporting a following sort of the Panama Papers type example, uh, there is something different to be done. Uh, you know, we may not have a devolution of broadcasting here, the uh, question where that comes from, uh, but that doesn't mean that we haven't got scope to do something uh, voluntarily across the sectors. Uh, so you guys, in terms of regulation, I don't know where you work with off but certainly as, as a journalist and as our assembly members to encourage that. I mean, I, um, I'm something I passionately believe should happen. Um, I had conversations with people at BT Wales about it. Um, they have that cooperation in terms of specific investigation stories has never got off the ground. I think, you know, they were good conversations and I think it's something we could still explore, certainly in terms of, um, you know, we, um, um, the European Journalism Centre is News Impact Summit. So yesterday there was lots of discussion yesterday about um, cooperation, collaboration, uh, both at um, researching stories, investigating stories level, but also in terms of sharing expertise, sort of um, backup solutions, <coughs> that kind of thing between, um, you know, kind of terminology established media and, and, and hyperlocal. Um, so yeah, I, th I, I completely agree. I think, you know, for me, what, you know, what's unhelpful a little bit in, um, uh, in Wales, to my mind, um, uh, you know, I don't disagree with anything Beth had said about um, the, 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 the sort of profile of the media in Wales, but there's a sort of unhelpfully adversarial um, environment, I think, between publishers, and, um, and I just think, you know, Wales is plenty big enough for, you know, lots more. Certainly, you know, um, uh, in terms of the hyperlocal network, you know, there was a question um, that came up in this one yesterday about whether publishers you know, like us, it's actually a different publisher, but publishers like us have a duty of care or level of responsibility to support um, hyperlocal publishers, and the answer came back that no, there are capacities. And I, I, I couldn't disagree with that any more strongly um, because, you know, um, to be quite frank, I mentioned in my comments earlier that, um, you know, I, I would make no attempt to hide the fact that we don't employ as many journalists that we did. Um, any 
think that's not good for that video. You know, that, that the plant's really big and the plant's really big. Um, we, are, we are the only publisher, commercial publisher, trying to report on Wales as a nation. Um, and also, we are the local publisher in quite a lot of places. And that creates a huge, you know, that's a difficult thing to, to try and achieve. And for me, so is it, you know, is it in the interest of the Welsh media that there's a strong national view of, 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 of a publisher that takes issues that affect Wales as a nation, but also there's a strong uh, underpinning of that by a network of local publishers, be they Rhyming to us or, or, or high work, or I mean, 100% yes. I mean, it makes our world so much easier, so much, uh, you know, it allows us to focus on, you know, an achievable number of things if we're not spread so thinly because of the lack of infrastructure around it. So, um, you know, collaboration, yes, absolutely. You know, I think the, the Welsh media can only be positive. Yeah, can I just say, I think collaboration is good, but I think I talk in the term of high people. And they said, I don't, I don't think it goes online that they're posting here actually, that they've been in situations where um, some larger um, broadcasters have taken their stories and not referenced where that story's come from. And so if you want to build a, an environment of cooperation and comradeship in this agenda, then you have to be respectful of those people coming through who may then provide that story locally that you know a bigger organisation can't do. And I think that's the respect agenda we need. I mean, our committee did say that we think that we need to encourage um, people to work together to support hyperlocal uh, to get off their feet um, and not see them as a you know competitor in that sense, but to help with their journalistic capacity. Um, we've got BBC Democracy team now. I mean, you know, I've got reservations uh, about that. I think it should have been, you know, if we were going to do something like that, I agree with you. It should have been much wider than. Uh, the BBC and you know uh, collaborating with some larger um, uh, just on that point it, it is just just to just to, as as as, uh, well, as a as a host as a host um, employer so we employ just to, just as a matter of um, a fact on that we employ those but any publisher from hyper local up who has submitted that to that scheme as a uh, to receive that copy can have that copy so it's not a subsidy to us to to mm. to, to to have those journeys that that is the BBC paying for uh, um, the production of that content, which is then available for anyone who wants to I take it. I know the content so is like available, but um, initially people couldn't apply to, to carry out the role you were doing because they simply didn't have mm. the background. But, that, but, that's, but then we don't, we don't control the administrative you know, but, but, but Exactly, but, but in a way, that, that we, we, we are taking, you know, it's, it's harder work to employ them than it is just to take the wire, the wire copy that they produce. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's very strictly mandated what we're allowed to use them for. So it's not like just three extra bodies and I use them to do what you want. It's, there's, there's very, very strict guidelines on how we use those people. And everything they produce is available to anyone who signs up to it. So, you know, actually, we employ them. We take on the workload of, you know, the HR costs of employing them to the, um, the, the workload for the newsroom of, 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 of reading, checking, copy, editing their content. If you're a partner in that, in that, in that scheme, you receive that content and that's open to, to publishers of all size. So I think, I think it's just a very important um, uh, clarification to make sure that we aren't saying that basically that's a that's a sort of like bung in our back pocket to have three extra reporters to do what we want with which is you know, I'm not saying that's what you're saying but that's how it's been you mm. know described in some areas it's I really important that's not seen I really agree with me on this point because I sit on the BBC Democracy Democracy European Group um, and initially the scheme the doors were very very close to um, community and hyper local news publishers purely because they hadn't thought of the logistics of how we would work mm. And in order to, I don't know, do, do you all know what the local democracy reporter scheme is? Um, so the BBC um, was uh, ahead of the new charter that was coming out and was trying to kind of think about what, how it would need to change and, and adapt and, and what services it would need to offer. And it recognised that the BBC, along with the majority of other news publishers, were not uh, covering um, democratic issues, basically local council meetings, in the way that they used to and the way they should be. So they thought in order to give the best value for money to the licence fee payer, they'd put a pot of money together and they would give those to news publishers to employ 150 reporters across the UK who would go and cover um, lots of public meetings that are kind of um, health boards and um, local council meetings so that we get back to those kind of bread and buttered stories that were not being covered. 
Um, but the issue came when you needed to be set up as an established business and have a proven history of employing somebody before you could receive that money. So obviously that was a really big issue if you were a very small publisher and you were a sole trader <coughs> and employed freelancers because you didn't have that uh, record of uh, managing people and doing payroll and holiday pay and, and tax and all that kind of stuff. Um, so then uh, it was set up so that you could, um, the criteria to receive the content from the news wires was the same as to employ somebody. So then we kind of had two, dif two different sections and that's where we set up as ICNN um, because the BBC said we can only share uh, content with people who are quality and reputable news publishers. And that's where we came up and that's where there were big discussions over well, how do you define what is a quality and reputable news publisher. So all the entry criteria that we were talking about, that's where that came up. Um, and we've also talked about collaboration. So there was a, um, a conference a few months ago organised by uh, REACH, I do believe, um, and they had 100 regional um, and national editors from across the UK, and they invited me along to talk about collaboration with Committee on Health and Local News Journalists. And four full slides were just full of reasons why uh, this was going to be really problematic because as Beth Ann said, um, you know, when I, uh, my, my favourite comment when I said, you know, I've been asked to talk about collaboration as a representative of this, so, you know, I want to take your views forward. My favourite comment was somebody saying, thank you for giving me the opportunity to offload 10 years of pent up anger and frustration. I can feel a bile rising <laughs> from the pit of my stomach as I write this. Because basically, they have been on the ground and they have been working more often than not because as a startup business, uh, you don't in any in any sector, not just journalism. You're not profitable when you first start a, a startup business, um, so you're pretty much working for free or doing another job at the same time. And we've been finding a lot of people have just been kind of cutting and pasting their work and saying, "Thank you very much. We haven't got local reporters, and now we'll take your work. Thank you very much." And so it's not to say that collaboration wouldn't work. And I went there with an open mind and open arms and said, "Absolutely, we are open to talking about collaboration, and we would love to see collaboration work. However, we have to appreciate it." That we're not starting with a clean slate here a lot of fingers have been burnt previously um, but we are having conversations and they will be ongoing and i think it's really important that we do collaborate um and the so we've just received um money um from the google digital news initiative um to create a uk-wide hyper local news agency so we're working in partnership with the uh, media innovation studio at um, the university of central lancashire and tech partners in um uh, called Omni from Bristol and what we're looking to do is to build a platform where content that's been produced by um, our members ac across the UK gets fed in so good quality source get fed in and then other larger news organisations will buy that will subscribe to it like any other news buyers so that means then that they actually money goes back to the content creators and the, the, the kind of the USP of it is that yes you could go and troll and kind of get them all um, but it's, it's going to be one repository of good quality news stories that kind of drop into an inbox somewhere. And then there's, there's, lines, there's um, lines of communication that can be open then for other organisations to say, that's great, you're on the path, you know, we'll pay you, can you go back and get us some more quotes and some more photos? And actually, we're starting to look at generating new revenue streams uh, in that as well. And we uh, perceive whether this will happen or not, in that with this bird's eye view of all these local stories, we will start to see, in the same way as you were talking about, the Bureau Local, that we'll start to see lots of themes and stories emerging on, in, in communities right across Wales and the UK that actually have a national importance and we can bring it together and then we can start collaboratively saying, OK, I'm going to do a freedom of information request to my local council, who's in? So it kind of very similar, and we were talking to Bureau Local and we sort of partnering with them as well. And that would be fantastic to see if you've got, you know, your BBCs, your ITVs, your, your, your uh, Media Wales, and your Hyperlocals all working together and saying, OK, we'll all publish our own stories to our own communities, but when you bring it together, wow, that's going to be an, a, a major story. So there are ways, um, you know, but we're not starting from, if we'd have been having these conversations sort of six years ago when, the, when our sector was in its infancy, and... Um, so much um, cutting and pasting, I was going to say stealing, cutting and pasting <laughs> of work uh, hadn't been there then, I'm not saying you guys, it's, it's, it's across the board, it's not, it's not, I'm not pointing any fingers, this is what I'm going to say, that it's just across the UK, mm. it's, it's other publishers, broadcasters are taking the, that content, so we've still got a lot of work to do looking at the legalities of that as well, so um, but yeah, you know, collaboration, you know, we're all stronger working together. It's a good way to go forward.
to get us going. To get us going. Yes. <laughs> no. Not the other day, though. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I'm uh, from India. I have a very basic question. You said that it, you monitor uh, content that goes on newspapers, but my question is how do you monitor content that goes on television channels? Because primarily because of the frenzy of uh, putting out news at a particular time, uh, being the first to do it, you know, that frenzy kind of uh, compromises the content to a very large extent. And that in turn ends up propagating fake news because a lot of time what happens is that you tend to publish or you tend to present news which uh, in the next 10 minutes, for example, ends up being incorrect. So how, and then of course you change it and you put the correct news forward, but you've already put out 10 minutes of fake news technically. How does one monitor that kind of content? Because uh, because of that, you know, time constraint, you don't have the time to recheck your news. You do not have time to go back to like three different sources and confirm your news. How do you tackle that in today's day and age, especially with digital media coming in? So, just to be clear, um, we don't regulate television. Know, know. It's regulated yeah. by by Ofcom, um, but that's an issue for for them as well. But I think it's, it's also an issue. I mean, when I say newspapers, I also mean the digital side of newspapers. And you know, having spent time uh, with local newspaper offices, I visit them frequently. Um, for many of them, the thing that matters is being a digital publisher. The newspaper is a byproduct of that almost. Um, and so, I mean, it's a real issue for, for local newspapers as well. Um, I'd say I still have, even given the time pressures, I still have the same expectation that care will be taken before that story is published. It's certainly, and, and this is this is not just true of local publications. We regulate the Mail Online. Um, Mail Online is one of those organisations that likes to publish very quickly. Um, has a huge number of journalists working for it, publishing stories from all over the world. Um, it is no excuse, in our terms, for them to say. We published this story, but it was wrong, but it was only up to five minutes. Yeah? My expectation is that it will be right when it's published, and that's my expectation of an editor that before it's published, that they are confident that they've taken the care to make sure it's right. Um, you know, if somebody does publish something that turns out not to be true, then the length of time it's been published for would be a, a mitigation in terms of the sanction they might get, but still, our expectation would be that they have taken the care that is necessary before publishing that story. There's no way to regulate that at the end, right? How do you mean? I mean, there's no way to hold channels accountable for the wrong information that they put up air. At least so far, there isn't any but, way that they are made to and, pay for it. And I don't, that and I don't do television, so, so I can't... I know, I know you're not in a bit, talking on a very large scale. But, but in talking... Terms of whose news do you trust? Yep. How does one trust the information that even comes on television? And again, it comes down to which um, broadcasters you trust. So I was with the BBC for nearly 14 years, and you know, the, we, we, it was drummed into us, it's better to be right than to be first. And we all want to be there first. And, and I'm speaking from experience, I was their social media producer for BBC Wales for nearly two years. Um, and um, and it was at right when social media was at its infancy, so set up a lot of the tr Twitter social media accounts for BBC Wales News, Country Affairs, and Politics. And I was responsible for the first ever story that broke for BBC Wales on social media because we realised that it was a big breaking news story. It was the um, it was the death of Guy Speed, who was the uh, Wales football coach at the time, and we had a tip off on a Sunday afternoon. We happened to be in on a Sunday because there was um, a boat missing off the coast of Anglesey, and there was rumours that Prince William were in it. Actually, he was in the rescue helicopter, helicopter looking for them. So there was mayhem, and then we had this phone call. So of course we had to verify the check, it was exactly the same way we would anyway. And we realised this story would not hold in the age of social media until you always hold a story to the biggest and the largest audience. And that would have been Wales today and for England now. Just would never have held that story. So we made a decision to actually break the story on social media. Um, and we, for the first kind of 10 minutes we owned the story in so much as anybody can own the story and according to the BBC and BBC reporting. And after about 10 minutes we started to see all these other things coming in. And I cannot tell you the backlash that I was getting saying, come on BBC, other people are saying this and other people are saying that. Why, where are you? Where's the update? BBC, we pay for this service with our licence fee. 
call yourselves a broadcaster and actually I don't know where they've got that information from it was a source has said or according to a policeman and as it happened it was a reporter knew a policeman that happened to know something I didn't know that policeman and actually my defence in the court of law could not be oh they said it first because my paper <coughs> Bishop said it first, if I broadcast it and that was wrong, um, and then there's another broadcast, I won't name them, their motto allegedly is never wrong for long. So let's, I'm doing exactly what you say, get it out there and worry about it later. And that absolutely comes down to trust in news. How do you ever trust that information? You can't. So that's where you start to, you know, know and recognise, and that's why you need trusted journalists, you know, and the byline on newspapers always used to carry so much weight, because you're like, oh, actually, that's the chief political reporter, that way this is going to be good, you know, and that's where it's really important, it's, you know, and for people to support those journalists that you know do a really good job, and out the ones that you know are not. I think in a breaking news situation, well, it undermines, you know, you might think, oh, we need to be first with this, I'm not sure why we need to be first with it. But if you keep doing that and you keep being wrong, then that erodes trust in your brand. <coughs> because it's slightly different, I think. You know, I've talked a lot about <coughs> you know, the concept of, of truth and, 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 and these variable now, it seems. But, but I think it's some a story like that, or a breaking situation. I mean, I, I, you know, in this example, I always think of um, a story, a tragic story a few years ago, where two people were stabbed on Queen Street in Central Cardiff um, in the hours of the morning. And you know, the national media were all over that. All sorts of rumours and gossip about what had happened, and you know, it was this sort of like drugs bust, or was it like sort of like this, you know, um, you know, love affair gone wrong spectacularly, and um, and we didn't have any of that, and we and it was everywhere, and it'd be very tempting. We thought, you know, the new line breaks, it's trending everywhere straight away. Very tempting to chase that, but we refused to do that. We would think, well, we're not going to publish anything we don't know. Um, lots of it turned out not to be true. And the most gratifying thing that day was by the middle of the afternoon, Queen Street Murders Wells Online was trending on, on Google Trends because I think, you know, because people were trusting that actually, funny enough, there's one published, you know, that, that they're, they're putting things out where they know them and they haven't published anything so it's wrong. And, and actually, we were slower than nearly every publisher on stories in our backyard that day. But when we published on it, we were right and people were coming to us to look at what we said as a result. And that was really encouraging. And I think now because you were the local publisher, mm. it was on your doorstep. So again, coming back to the closer you are to the source, mm. the less, you know, if I, if I told you a sentence over there and asked you to whisper it all the way down, I guarantee you, you wouldn't get the same sentence as down here. And that's what happens. Somebody will add a bit of opinion. Somebody will read the comment as fact. How many times have you read a Facebook story and then somebody is ranting about it and then go, have you actually read the article? Because they just form opinions and then a Facebook group has been set up saying, you know, and before you know it, you know, uh, your mother's auntie's dog was riding a motorbike down the street uh, that had nothing to do with the new pancake shop opening. It, it's, you know, and again, you were the local, and, that, and that's kind of, that's just so important. You were there, you knew what was going on. It's just the pressure environment that I was referring yeah, to. Yeah, but it's, but it is. calling you yeah, and telling you, why so. don't we have it? But why there's always been a pressurised environment. And um, uh, it's about, it's just about maintaining integrity in that pressurised environment. You know, <coughs> that's so now, but newspapers would have had, you know, editions all the day. You know, so there's always a deadline in 10 minutes, you know, um, and whether it's TV or print or online now, you know, you're already too late. Um, but you still can maintain that integrity all along. So you always have a deadline. Yeah, thank you. I, I'm Andrew Elton. I'm from Ecuador and South America, and actually, I, I participated in other five journalists and actually the government persecuted us because of that and I have to run away to the United States and I'm not here. So I just want to ask you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and well and I'm in our embassy is Julian Assange in, in London so we are pretty famous for that but well, that's another issue. Um, well I just want to ask uh, all of uh, anyone who want to intervene about the values that your audiences um, um, ask or, or why, what kind of values your audiences uh, look at in your uh, news organization in that way to trust you that your your news are, are true? You know? I mean, uh, you already uh, mentioned that uh, being impartial and integrity, this kind of things, but when you ask your audiences why you read us, why you consume our information, what values they um, look at in your, in your news organization? Um, it's a really good question. Um, 
and it's something we think about a lot. And you know, um, we try to have, you know, think about keywords that we we want to be to people. Um, you know, and chief among them for me is useful. Um, uh, we want to play a role in helping you live your life and, and in everything that means. So that means, um, you know, finding out that your commute to work this morning is going to be disrupted because two lanes are closed on the M4 and it's going to take you an extra hour to get to work, but also be useful in terms of helping you understand what's changed in your environment. So like, you know, if you're um, just trying to do some of the most mundane talks and about a massive story so far, just trying to use some mundane examples as possible. So if your bin collection day is changing in your area, we want to help make sure that you've got access to that information. We also want to make sure that you understand, you know, as I said, uh, in my opinion, Mark, some forces that, that impact on your life and, and if things are changing, uh, uh, if decisions are made by the people who we elect, then how would that actually impact on your pocket and your household and your environment uh, uh, and your education and family and your health care uh, and all that kind of thing. So, so um, yeah, useful is, is a big one. Uh, challenging is another one, you know. Um, uh, you know, we want to champion what's good, and we want to call out what's bad. Um, so I think it's really a valuable thing. I could go on, but I think it's a really valuable thing to actually have stated values and thinking what are we here for. You know, I've, I've, I've you know talked about being um, uh, you know, uh, in the cruise ship example about being measured and verified and all those things. But I think um, you know, knowing what you want to be in relation to your readers and what role do you want to play in their lives, um, I think is very well valuable. Sort of of use for you three. I wonder if there's any gigs that have any big pop stars come to Cardiff who are a really brilliant guide on how to get the tickets. <laughs> it's amazing how popular it is because mm. I mean, I thought you'd just go and buy tickets, but like, it turns out people are really, really, really search that information. And, and oh, it, so. usually from yeah. two websites yeah. and what time the lines open yeah. and all this kind of stuff. And it's the one place if you ever need to go to a gig in Wales, then Wales Online is literally your place to get your <laughs> gig ticket buying guide. You also do a lot of very serious journalism. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking of the useful bit there. Do you think national news agencies that sell stories to multiple news outlets, um, do you think that undercuts the uh, attempts to encourage pluralism in journalism, or do you think it's a model that works? So you just think sort of not a, just a, a normal news agency? Yeah, so like the Press Association or like you know, international, like Reuters and stuff, they'll sell the story to multiple news outlets and like run with them. They will, but actually they've got the business model right because otherwise they would take them anyway, so that's what we're finding, so that's why we're set up this kind of like a hyper open news agency. Um, and what they do have is they have their own journalists. Um, so again, uh, PA were at the uh, with their local democracy reporter scheme and they were kind of questioning how this would affect their business if the BBC was only putting reporters in to cover initially uh, courts were, were factored in as well and they realised there was a number of smaller press agencies that covered <coughs> courts and that's why they concentrated just on councils. Um, to be honest with you, if those, if those journalists were still there on the ground covering those stories they would be being produced anyway. Um, so I think they're just filling a gap in the market really so they have um, they cover a lot of all kinds of things and sporting events and things like that. And, and, and what we've heard a lot of today is how newsrooms don't have those journalists. So it's not necessarily that they are um, uh, that they're kind of undermining. So a lot of those stories wouldn't get covered anyway. Um, and I, I think it's really important that when people do produce good quality journalism, that they um, get you know some kind of financial rewards and so for it. So there's been a, a, a test case where um, up in Manchester, <coughs> where um, a small news publisher had done a lot of work, months and months and months researching uh, and uh, doing a big investigation, and a rival sort of legacy traditional newspaper had taken the content. This was all in civil court, and they um, they hadn't. It was any direct courts. They hadn't cut and pasted it, but they'd formed their own report purely on the information in the first report and the judge ruled <coughs> in favour of the small publisher and said it was to do with sweat on the brow. But actually, they put months and months and months of work into that for somebody else to kind of come along and take it. Um, so, 
Yeah. Um, I think your question mainly is, is it whether, because it goes to multiple people, um, this, a story would get picked up and run with anyway. Um, and good journalists in those news publications, what you would hope they would do is, they would use the PA copy or any other news agency, there's lots of them out there, would take that and use it as the basis for a story and would then say, okay, they're not going to just, you know, like the journalism, we will just turn out these press releases and come in. But actually go, ah, oh, this is really interesting, we'll get some of the information up and now we'll go on and we will do, we will move the story on, we will do more interviews, we will do a bit more digging, we'll, we will follow up on it. And that's what you would hope to see, is that actually when you see it in multiple publications, that it looks slightly different in all of them. And if, and if it doesn't, then it's, and it will likely be because it's a story that you wouldn't choose to embellish anyway, it's a court case or a hearing <coughs> which can't be reported multiple ways, it has to be reported one way, and so yes, it might be the same copy in multiple publications, but it's not a um, copy that, were it not for that news agency, would there, there'd be wildly different interpretations of because it's, it's something that's very bound by the restrictions how it's reported. And I'm sure Bethany would agree that the more publications were running the stories of what was happening in the assembly, the better, the more the more yeah. people see that story, oh, the more opinions, the more follow-ons. So actually, it's better that it happens that way than it doesn't get reported at all. Yeah, the PA sometimes fill that gap where they haven't been able to, uh, to to help. But I will give you a funny story about PA news. If it, um, about like eight years ago, before I was married, I'll say I went over to Denmark on holiday and I just did a like a funny tweet saying, "Oh, I'm not gonna come back. I'm gonna find my husband here." And they actually reported that as a serious thing. Bethan Jenkins at the time is you know staying in Denmark to find a husband, and I'm like, whoa! Now. <laughs> Is your husband Danish? He's Indian, so I went to another continent to find him. We've got time for one more quick one. Quick one. Yeah. We've got a couple at the back who've had their hands up for a bit. So. mistake or reports an inaccuracy you could expect a clarification of that or an apology online comments generated by certain stories that contain inaccuracies are left there until an individual reports them should the news source have a responsibility to report on that and and put those people right So yeah, um, so yeah, you're right. So um, in terms of our processes, but that's a process we've actively chosen. So it's, we call it post moderation. So um, yes, um, it's you know, it's, a, it's a community that, 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 that moderates checks itself. Um, you know, we get you know thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of comments today um, sometimes, and um, you know the idea that we would sit there, go through all of those. Um, is, is to be quite frank, not something which we can. Which, to be honest, any, almost any uh, media company, however big, can, can can justify the resource to to do. Um, so, yes, um, uh, that that is what happens. Do we have a responsibility to, to step in? Um, yeah, um, and I think um, we do do that. Um, we probably don't do that enough. Um, I think you know you see some really good examples of individual journalists doing it. You see some good examples of um, publications doing it. It's really interesting what happens when you do. Um, I wrote a piece um, myself last year, uh, this year, this year, um, during the um, uh, during all the stories about um, harassment of um, of women, um, of talking about not so much that issue uh, directly, but the really insidious um, uh, atmosphere of men trying to immediately defend and attack the women who made the allegations and how, how vile that was. And then in a sort of like, you know, self-perpetuating cycle, then the comments in that piece filled up with attacking me for attacking them. <laughs> and, but it was interesting, so I went in straight away and the comments were all right, right. 
buckle up and take these people on. And and it was kind of interesting how that worked because you're kind of fighting this fire here and then another one pops up over here and you're kind of fighting that one and you fight. And, but gradually by kind of going into every thread and, and kind of getting on top of the sort of initial influx of trolls, um, they kind of started to quieten down and um, uh, and then, it, yeah, and then it kind of it kind of stopped for a, for a bit, um, and then and the, and, the, and the thread went quiet, and then about an hour later, um, women came started to come into the into the thread and um, post about the you know start to have a go back at the awful men who'd kind of initially dive in with their awful opinions, and um, uh, and it was really interesting about you know the experience for me about. You know, kind of what happens because you think you know the internet comment sections are full of awful people, and they are, not largely. Um, <laughs> but actually, it's what happens when it's like a terrible conversation happening in a pub among like five people in a pub full of people who actually got you know 